Welcome back, everybody, to Four Winds Fellowships. I'm Tim Warner. Um, we are in the Gospel of John, and this is the seventh in the series on pristine apostolic monotheism. That's what the series is titled. Um, apostolic monotheism, that is the monotheism, the teaching of one God by the apostles. Pristine means uncorrupted, and <clears throat> as we I think I've mentioned before, the doctrine of God and his son have been corrupted down through the ages, and we have a variety of views today which um, present God and his son and the spirit as uh, completely different things, right? So what we're presenting in the series is the way that the very earliest Christians, closest to the apostles, the, the earliest documented understanding of God and his son after the New Testament um, is what we are presenting in this series. And of course, a lot of people would say, well, they got it wrong. But um, after a lot of study of their writings and study of the scripture and the way they handle the scriptures, I'm convinced that they actually were correct for the most part. All right. But anyway, we are, we are teaching what the Bible says. It just happens to agree with what the early Christians um, wrote. So let's, uh, let's, let's put it that way. All right. Now, last time we went through, uh, in John one, we went up through uh, verse 12. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, today I want to go through again through 12 and go through verse 14. These are three verses, really, really important verses. They have a lot to say. Now I'm going to read to you from the last generation version, which is on your screen. That's our translation for wins translation. Um, which is what we've been using all along in these lessons. Um, what you're going to see as I read this is a major difference in verse 13 to what you will see in most other Bibles. All right, so if you have another Bible translation, you might want to open it up. Look at verse 13 as I read this. All right, so uh, let me read it first and then we'll talk about the difference. But as many as received him, and that is referring back to Lagos, which we showed in the last video, is the one who through whom the world was created the one who created or excuse me who was the god's agent in creating all things and he was the original life that is life originated in him uh, we saw that and then um so now we're in verse uh, 12 so let's start there but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of god to those believing unto the name of him who was begotten, not out of bloods, nor out of the will of the flesh, nor out of the will of a male, but out of God. And Lagos became flesh and sojourned among us, and we gazed upon his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Now, any of, any of you who have been following along in some other translation, you will notice immediately that what I have here, the word was, is singular while in most other Bible translations it's plural. It's an important point because of him who was begotten is a reference to Christ, that is the Son of God. And you can see that here where it says, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Uh, him who was begotten refers to the one, the only begotten from the Father. All right. Most other translations have the plural. It says something like this, do those believing unto the name or unto his name, comma, they'll put a comma here to break up the sentence, who were begotten, were is plural. So who were begotten then would refer back to the children of God here and how they became the children of God. Did Christians become the children of God by being begotten? was begotten all right this is a critical difference <clears throat> now um what we have in this translation and we're following a, a different uh text which we'll explain in a moment um this this verb here that's uh translated was would be aorist it's an aorist tense verb um the question is, is it singular or plural? Now, what does the aorist tense verb do? 
an aorist tense, if it's an indicative verb, which this is, is referring to a past event, a singular past event. All right. Now, here's a question for you. Was there a singular past event in which all those believing on Christ's name were begotten? Think about that carefully. A singular past event, remember it's a singular verb, would mean then that all who believe in his name, if, if this is plural, were begotten at the same event. They were begotten by God at the same time, at the same event. Well, we know that that's actually technically not true, right? Each of us are considered begotten of God or born of God when we become a Christian, when we're baptized into Christ, we're joined with Christ, we're considered um, begotten of God at that point in time. But we're all, we all are, have that transformation in our lives at a different point in time, right? So that really makes the singular aorist tense verb here a little bit out of place if it's plural, all right? It just seems a little awkward in this context. We would expect an aorist tense verb, even if it's plural, if you read it this literally, to mean that everyone who is a child of God was begotten at one singular event. All right. Now, <clears throat> this translation LGV has the singular. What does it mean if it's singular? It means him who was begotten, that is Christ. All right. Now, what's really important about this statement is that is these next words right here. So, if it's say if it's talking about Christians being begotten, or whether it's talking about Christ having been begotten, notice how it's qualified with these words: not out of blood, not out of the will of the flesh, nor out of the will of a male, but out of God. Ek theu, out of God. Ek means out of. Out of God. Are we begotten out of God? Mm, not really. Christ was begotten out of God. The Son was begotten out of God. All right. Are we begotten by blood's will of the flesh or the will of a male? Yes, we are. All right. So even every Christian, every person has been begotten in this manner which is speaking about normal human procreation. Now, some people are going to say, well, this is talking about the virgin birth, and that's why it says not out of blood or the will of the flesh or out of the will of the male. Well, yeah, the will of the male might work if you're talking about the virgin birth, but the blood and the will of the flesh is not correct because all Christ, when he was born from Mary, was born with blood, from blood, right? He carried Mary's blood and he had his own blood and no doubt he was bloody when he came out. And what about the will of the flesh? The will of the flesh. Did Mary have a choice in the matter of becoming Jesus' mother and all that? I mean, didn't after Gabriel announced to her um, that she had been chosen by God to bear the Messiah, what did she say? May it be unto me according to your word, right? Mary made the choice to have a child. This statement doesn't work well with that, right? So what I'm what I'm saying is this whole clause here, if you read it in most translations, who were begotten, meaning Christians, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor out of the will of a male, but out of God, it doesn't really fit um, the idea of Christians being begotten out of God. All right. <clears throat> okay. Now let's continue reading here. And Logos became flesh. Well, wouldn't that be explaining what was being stated here? I think so. Okay. Who was begotten is um, when Christ was first procreated out of God at the beginning of the creation. He was not procreated out of blood, out of anything human, right? Because he was procreated out of God. 
out of God himself. But then after he's procreated out of God, then it says Logos became flesh and sojourned among us. And we gazed upon his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Again, this statement, the only begotten from the Father, is a reference to this, him who was begotten, that is begotten of God. All right, now, I know a lot of people are going to disagree with this uh, translation and this reading, um, but let's look at these three points here, which I think provide significant evidence that the singular reading is the correct reading. All right. So here, number one, the old Latin, the Aramaic, Coptic, and Ethiopian copies have the singular reading, was begotten as opposed to were begotten. Now, these old copies, the Latin, Aramaic, Coptic, and Ethiopian, these, these um, translations were made from Greek texts originally. And those Greek texts that were translated into all these languages very, very early on, those Greek texts had to read like this in order for these translations to be made um, with the singular. All right. So uh, that's, I think that's pretty, pretty strong evidence. And again, these translations, now we don't have copies of Manu Ethiopian or Coptic or Aramaic manuscripts that go all the way back to the first or second century, as far as I know. But these, each of these languages had their own tradition where their manuscripts were copied over and over and over in those languages. And so whatever the original translation was from the Greek into that language, then that reading would be preserved in the copies that come from, you know, from each of those languages because the people um, who had the scriptures in those languages most for the most part only spoke those languages right so they wouldn't be trying to correct them from greek copies that came out later all right all right also i need to mention the fact that the greek the earliest greek manuscripts that we have with the plural reading who were begotten the very earliest of those possibly would be P66, which is the Gospel of John. There is one earlier fragment of John, but it doesn't include this passage. It's only a fragment from the later part of John. <clears throat> and that would be P52, I believe. Uh, P66 is a almost complete copy of the Gospel of John, and it has been dated by scholars uh, I think the original translator of it dated it to about AD 200. Other scholars coming later dated it to be much later, like the third or even the fourth century. Um, there are a couple of scholars who tried to push it back earlier to maybe the first half of the second century, something like that. But I think the scholarly consensus is that it's probably somewhere in the second or possibly third um, or, or possibly even the fourth century. So we don't know exactly how old that particular copy was, but we do know that P66 is from the area of Alexandria uh, in Egypt, and that was sort of the hotbed of Gnostic interpretations and Gnostic corruptions. In fact, there was one a Gnostic sect there uh, called that was started by a man named Valentinus, and um, he made a lot of use of the Gospel of John, but he apparently made some alterations to the Gospel of John. Um, we're going to talk about that again in a few moments. All right. Secondly, if you look at number two here, the singular reading that is referring to Christ, that is him who was begotten, is an aorist indicative verb. All right. I think I mentioned that before. Every other place in the entire New Testament where it speaks about Christians being begotten of God, it always uses the perfect tense. Almost always a perfect participle. I think only in one place it uses a perfect indicative verb. But the important part is that it's a perfect tense. So what is the difference between the aorist tense and the perfect tense? The aorist tense indicates a point in time in the past. That is the aorist indicative. All right. It's a historical event that something happened in the past. 
at one point in time. The perfect tense is describes a present condition that is the result of something that happened in the past. But it doesn't necessarily specify what it was that happened in the past. All right. So what we see is anytime in the rest of the New Testament, anywhere, that it talks about being begotten out of God, ektheu, out of God. When it's talking about Christ, it always uses the aorist tense because it refers to an event. When it's talking about Christians, it always, use, always uses the perfect tense, having been begotten. See the difference here? You can see the difference in English, right? Was begotten out of God is pointing to an event when this person was begotten out of God at this point in time. Having been begotten out of God is describing a present condition that is the result of something in the past. All right, you see that distinction? It's an important distinction. And the reason it's an important distinction is because um, Christians are, are only considered begotten of God because we are joined to the one who was the only begotten Son of God. All right, and this is why also John uses this expression, monogenes, only begotten. Only begotten means the only one begotten, the sole begotten one, right? Well, Christians are begotten, but only in the perfect tense, having been begotten. So it's essentially what John is doing when he uses this kind of language is he's, he talks about Christ as being the only begotten of the Father. You can see that right up here, right? The only begotten from the Father. That means the Father has produced no others directly. Okay, that is a actual offspring out of God. He's only produced one. That's his son. <clears throat> we are the begotten of God, or we are the having been begotten out of God. Because if we're joined to the Son of God, we're viewed by God as one with him. And so he looks at us collectively as the having been begotten out of God because he's only talking about the result. But when he's talking about a historical event of this begotten out of God, he always, if he uses the aorist tense, he's always referring to his son. All right. This holds true through the entire New Testament unless this is translated with a plural here, which is one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons why I'm convinced the singular is the correct reading. All right. It would be the only time Christians are referred to the begotten out of God. It would be the only time using the aorist tense referring to an event. All right. That's really, really important. All right. Now, thirdly, the earliest quotations of this, of this verse, both in Greek and in Latin, always quoted it with the singular. And that includes Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and some others. And what's also important is that these quotations, these witnesses, their quotes are older than all the Greek copies that we have that have the plural reading. So in other words, if you're going to just look at all the evidence, all the evidence would include all the manuscripts that we have in all the languages, that, um, you know, obviously the Greek is what it was written in originally. We look at all the Greek manuscripts and then we look at the translations from the very early Greek into these other languages. They have the singular. And now when we look at the earliest quotations from the early church fathers, whether they're writing in Latin or they're writing in Greek, either way, they quote this verse with the singular was begotten all right to me that's that's pretty powerful evidence that that is the correct reading all right now let's um i want to show you something that tertullian wrote tertullian wrote um against uh several of the different gnostics he wrote against uh, marcion he wrote against uh, the valentinian gnostics <clears throat> 
And he, he specifically talked about this verse, talked about it being corrupted and why it was being corrupted by the Valentinian Gnostics. All right. This is what Tertullian wrote. Now, remember, Tertullian is writing this quite a bit earlier than the oldest copy of John that we have in Greek that has the plural reading. All right. Uh, and he's arguing, of course, for the singular reading. He quotes it several times, actually, in the singular. Okay, so here's what Tertullian says. What then is the meaning of this passage? Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I shall make more use of this passage after I have confuted those who have tampered with it. They maintain that it was written thus, in the plural, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God as if designating those who were before mentioned as believing in his name, in order to point out the existence of that mysterious seed of the elect and spiritual which they appropriate to themselves. And by the way, the Valentinian Gnostics believed in election, sort of like Calvinists do. All right. Um, but how can this be when all who believe in the name of the Lord are, by reason of the common principle of the human race, born of blood, and of the will of the flesh, and of man, as indeed is Valentinus himself? <laughs> the expression is in the singular number as referring to the Lord. He was born of God. And very properly, because Christ is the word of God, and with the word, the spirit of God, and by the spirit, the power of God, and whatever else appertains to God. All right, this is a pretty, a pretty important statement that gives us some insight. Now, Tertullian himself wrote in Latin. And his copies, uh, as I said earlier in the previous slide, the old Latin manuscripts did have the singular reading in them in his, in his time, in his day, in the, uh, in the second century. All right. Um, so anyway, this, this statement, I think, should be considered extremely important and I think it should affect our translation all three of the things that I mentioned before are important but it's clear that the early Christian writers at least this one was convinced that this plural reading was a corruption by the Valentinian Gnostics all right so um, all right well we'll leave we'll leave that for now and move on all right now <clears throat> I wanted to point this out because, partly because a lot of people are really, really confused uh, when it comes to a couple of passages in 1 John. It seems in these passages from 1 John, the way that it's translated, without regard for the fact of whether it's talking about the ones or, or the begotten out of God as... In the perfect tense, which refers to Christians, as I said, versus begotten out of God in the aorist tense, which is always a reference to Christ. All right. I'm going to show you how it makes a difference in how we understand these two verses, which have confused so many people. The reason they've confused so many people is the way they're translated in our modern versions is that it appears to refer to individual Christians as being born of God and that they cannot sin sinless perfection right but that's not what they're teaching all right if we if we understand that anytime we see this begotten out of god in the perfect tense it's referring to christians anytime we see this begotten out of god in the aorist tense speaking of an event it's referring to christ john makes this distinction early on in his gospel and he follows through with the same pattern in first and second uh, John. So, all right, so look at first John 3 9, the way it's translated here. You might want to compare this to another translation and you'll see it makes a big difference. Also, most translations, or the old, the old King James used this word whosoever. I think most modern translations um, say whoever or something like that. It's an interesting statement because in the Greek, it literally says all. Um, the whole the whole and then it uses singular verbs 
So instead of saying every one, meaning each one individually, what the Greek actually says is the whole collectively. Okay, the entire collective of the redeemed is what it's talking about. So look at it, look at what it says here in First John uh, three nine. It says the whole entity, like I said, the most translations say whosoever. Having been begotten, this is perfect tense, all right, referring to the believers. The whole entity, having been begotten out of God, does not practice sin. That is, as a whole, as a collective whole. Why? Because his seed, that is God's seed, who is Christ. Christ is the only begotten, so he is technically God's seed. Because his seed, that is God's seed, that is the only begotten son, remains among it. And it is powerless to sin because it, ha it has been, perfect tense, begotten out of God. So the whole collective that is joined to Christ cannot sin because it's the body of Christ right? The son of God, who is the only begotten, he remains among it. So the whole collective doesn't sin. Does, do individual Christians sin? Yes, but the whole collective does not sin because it's joined to Christ and Christ cannot be joined to sin. All right. We see the same thing in 1 John 5, 18. We have the same language. We have observed that the whole entity and again, this is the uh, most translations say whoever, um, but it's it's the word whole or all, and then it uses a singular. We have observed that the whole entity, having been begotten out of God, again, it's talking about the collective of the redeemed, which is Christ and His church, His body, Christ and His body. In Paul's language, it would be Christ and His body that's here on earth. In John's language, it's the whole entity having been begotten out of God. But it means the same thing. All right. So we have observed that the whole entity having been begotten out of God does not sin. But the one who was begotten out of God. Here we have the aorist tense of the verb. He was begotten out of God. So the one who was begotten out of God, guards it, that is, the whole entity. And the wicked one does not touch his own, that is, Christ's own. All right, so Christ guards his church so that as a whole, it's not involved in sin. Do individuals sin? Yes. But the, but the body of Christ as a whole is preserved by Christ um, from the wicked one. All right, you get that? I hope that makes um, sense to you. Again, let me just state this again. I stated it before, but I want, I want to be absolutely clear. Everywhere in the New Testament where it talks about being begotten out of God, whenever it's referring to Christians, it always uses the perfect tense of the verb. All right, and the perfect tense, again, is referring to a present condition that is the result of a past action. It's not talking specifically about the past action necessarily. All right. But the aorist tense is talking about the past action. All right. Which is what we see here. The one who was begotten. Here it's aorist tense. Here it's perfect tense. All right. I hope that makes sense to you, and um, and I didn't lose half of the uh, the audience with the grammar talk. All right, I want to go back to um, I want to read the LGV version of John one one through fourteen. We've covered one through fourteen um, now in these series of lessons, and I want to read it sort of uh, continuously so we don't lose the flow. You, it sometimes you can lose the forest for the trees, right? We're going with a magnifying glass, looking at verb tenses and things like that. And you can tend to lose the flow and the flow is just as important as the details, right? So what I did in this, um, I have verses one through 14 here. And what I did is I highlighted in green, all of the words that refer to the son of God. 
All right, whether they are nouns, whether here's a here's a pronoun here, um, here's pronouns him him. We have life and light referred to him uh, as the life and as the light. Christ is both of those things, um, and then we have all of these terms. All right, so every time you see green. It's a reference to the same one who's mentioned in the very first sentence in uh, John's prologue. All right. Um, in the beginning was Logos, and Logos was with God, and Logos was God. Why does he say Logos was with God? That means Logos was in the presence of God, and Logos was God. Why does he say Logos was God? He's not referring to the same persons here as being God here and God here. It's not the same persons, but they're both called God. <clears throat> and if that's confusing to you, I would encourage you to read Psalm chapter 45, verses 6 and 7, where uh, the psalmist says, uh, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You loved righteousness and hated iniqu iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with oil above your companions. So he's called your th he says your throne O God and then he says your God has anointed you to be king basically to have the scepter and his, and a kingdom. So the one who holds the scepter who becomes the king who reigns in the kingdom is called God which we know is the son and the one who anoints him is his God which we know to be the father. All right so you've got the word God used of two persons right there in the very same sentence and we have the same thing here all right he's called god because he's appointed by god to be his representative and so christ reigns as god in the kingdom but also because throughout the past he was the image of the invisible god right the pagans had idols that were um, images they were visible representations paul says of christ that he is the image of the invisible god first produced of all creation that's colossians 1 15. All right, so um, we have this sort of the same concept here. All right, this one, that is Logos, was in the beginning with God. Everything originated through him. Paul says in Colossians 1.15, when he says that everything originated through him there, he says whether in heaven or on earth, the visible and the invisible, and he goes on to make sure that he didn't leave anything out. Right? Um, and without him, nothing originated. What has originated is, in him and now here in him is contrasted with through him you see that this is an important contrast through him means God created all things through his son using his son as an agent but now he says without him that is without the son nothing originated but what has originated in him not through him but in him was life that is because he is the first begotten of God and the life, that is this new life, which is the sun, was the light of men. What does the light mean? It's talking about he brings the revelation of God to mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not take hold of it. A man originated having been commissioned from beside God. The name given to him was John. This one arrived for a witness so that he should testify concerning the light, which is the Logos, so that all may believe through him. That is through the light or through Logos, rather. These, these pronouns have to refer to Logos because they're masculine. Light is neuter in Greek. All right, life in Greek is feminine. So him cannot refer to light specifically or life specifically. It has to refer to the masculine noun Logos. All right, we talked about that before. All right, he, that is John, was not the light, but came so that he should testify concerning the light. He was the true light, which come, coming into the world enlightens each man. He was in the world. That is, he was in the world before coming into the world. That's the point. And the world originated through him. Again, him here has to refer to Logos. Without him, nothing originated. And the world did not know him. He came into his own things, that is, his own inheritance. Psalm 2 talks about that God promised his son on the very day that he was begotten, right? Psalm 2, 7, 
that God says to him, you are my son today, I have begotten you, ask of me, I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Well, this is what it's talking about. He came into his own things and his own people, that is the Jews, did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those believing unto the name of him who was begotten. Up here, the first life. What originated in him was life. That's when he was begotten. Um, okay, who was begotten, not out of bloods, nor out of the will of the flesh, nor out of the will of a male, but out of God. Then afterwards, Logos became flesh and sojourned among us. And we gazed upon his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Again, the only begotten from the Father means only one person has ever literally been begotten out of God. And that is his only begotten Son. Everyone else is joined to the Son and we become the having begotten been begotten or the whole collective having been begotten out of God collectively not individually all right now just one more statement about about this here when it says we gazed upon his glory that's referring to um, the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter James and John uh, John wrote this went up to the Mount and Christ was transfigured before them and they uh, he appeared in glory um, and so John says this glory is of the only begotten from the Father. That is, uh, this he was clothed in glory here. And what's really interesting about this is in, in John uh, chapter 17, in Jesus' prayer in the garden, um, he says um, to the Father, he says, um, to restore to him the glory that he had beside the Father before the world was. Uh, technically as before it was to be um, this is what he ha he possessed glory beside the father at the very very beginning when he was literally begotten out of God all right that's what these passages are indicating all right well uh, that's all I have for today we will uh, pick up hopefully in about two weeks we'll uh, get on to um, the rest of the prologue that is verses 15 through 18 and then that will be the last um, lesson that we'll do in John's prologue and then we're going to go back to the Old Testament and we're going to pick up another theme regarding wisdom as a person as is portrayed in Proverbs and show how the Apostles interpret that theme of wisdom to actually also be the Son of God who was appearing in the Old Testament times. All right, we'll, we'll look at that, not next time, but the time after that. All right, God bless. It's been a pleasure, and hopefully we'll see you the next time.